During the late 19th century, while men were settling the new frontier and rushing off to the latest boom towns, women of easy virtue found wicked lives west of the Mississippi. Aspiring men headed west trying to strike it rich, digging for gold. Prostitutes hoped to capitalize on the fortune-seeking pioneers. Miss Julia Bulette, the siren of the Silvertown, was one entrepreneurial soiled dove. Born in London, England, 1832, she grew up without a mother. She often watched the riverboats visiting with her uncle and saw the fancy ladies escorting the men. Young Julia knew when she grew up she wanted to be one of those fancy ladies. So in 1863, she arrived in Virginia City, Nevada. She had immediate competition against other fanny tossers, as they were called, but she remained an independent contractor. She did not work as a parlor madam for a house of ill repute managing other women. She had a number of regulars, including Thomas Peasley, a saloon owner. He was her favorite paramour. In addition to running a business, Peasley was a volunteer firefighter for the Virginia Engine Company No. 1. Julia supported them monetarily when she could. She even went on calls to cheer them on. In honor of her service, she became the only female honorary member of the department. She was awarded a handsome feminine rendition of their uniform. Julia remained greatly sought after by the miners, often charging $1,000 a night for her services. She was described as having been a beautiful, tall, and slim brunette with dark eyes. She was refined in manner with a humorous, witty personality. With her earnings, Julia was able to build a magnificent brothel in the Rococo design. She named it Julia's Palace, and it was the largest, most prosperous brothel in Virginia City. It was staffed with beautiful, imported girls, served French wine and cuisines. Herself and her girls were dressed in the latest Parisian fashions. She was a good friend to the miners, and they adored her. One described her as having caressed Sun Mountain with a gentle touch of splendor. Julia stood by her miners in times of trouble and misfortune, once turning her palace into a hospital. After several hundred men became ill from drinking contaminated water, she nursed the men back to health herself. When an Indian attack became imminent, Julia chose to remain behind with the miners instead of seeking shelter in Carson City. She also raised funds for the Union cause during the Civil War. She appeared regularly in the streets of Virginia City, clad in costly sable furs and jewels, driving a lacquered brome carriage bearing symbols of royalty on the panel, a shield with four aces and a lion. Perhaps Julia's greatest triumph was when the firefighters elected her queen of the Independence Day Parade. She carried a fire horn full of fresh roses and wore her fire helmet. The firemen marched behind her. Julia continued to donate large sums of money for new equipment and often lent a hand operating the water pump on calls or work the handcart engine. At Virginia City, prostitutes would throw balls, basically fundraisers to help widows and orphans. Despite her profession and numerous clients, Thomas Peasley was the love of Julia's life. He was a businessman, fire chief, and man's man. He settled things with good manners. A gentleman's duel. He once shot a man dead to settle a score. The second time he wasn't so lucky. Though earning the honor of Nevada's toughest, Peasley had a gunfight with a rival fire chief. He was shot through the heart and had a hole in his skull. Both men were mortally wounded in 1866. Julia kept working but became quite depressed. She started drinking and took laudanum to ease her emotions. 
Virginia City was laid out in distinct sections. A and B streets were reserved for rich folks, like the Silver Kings, the bankers, and mining engineers. C Street had stores, gambling halls, saloons, and eateries. And if a fellow had finished his meal and had an evening out drinking and gambling, he could saunter on down to D Street where the soiled doves nested. On January 19th, 1867, Bulette dressed to go to a performance at Piper's Opera House. Although she had always been allowed to sit in the main section of the theater, a new town ordinance dictates she now must sit in a special viewing box reserved for the red light ladies of the town. The curtains were to remain tightly drawn to hide them from view of the proper ladies of Virginia City. A door attendant denied her entrance to the theater that night. Shaking off her indignation, Bulette went to visit her friend and neighbor, Miss Gertrude Holm. After a nice evening meal and pleasant conversation, <laughs> Bulette left Gertrude's company a little after 11 p.m. that night. She explained she was to meet a minor friend for a special appointment at her house, but it was the last time anyone would hear from Julia Bulette again. At about 11.30 the next morning, Holmes stopped by with breakfast for the two of them. After going upstairs, to her horror, she discovered her friend, Bulette, had been cruelly murdered in bed. Upon inspection, the parlor was in perfect order, except for a vase and some books thrown in the floor. In the bedroom lay the body of the woman, the bedclothes in disarray, as though the last death throes had been a terrible fight. The evidence determined Julia had been beaten and strangled. Investigators believed the scene had been partially staged and that the intruder had left through the back door. Since tree bark had been found in her hair, it was believed the assailant had beaten her with a piece of wood. Missing from the house was a fur coat, jewelry, and rolls of material. News about the beloved prostitute and Good Samaritan's death spread like a prairie fire. As grief hit Virginia City, the mines, mills, and even the saloons closed out of respect for the sport and gal of Silver Lake. The day of her funeral was a cold, snowy Monday. A crowd turned out to pay their last respects at the engine number one firehouse. Religious leaders held firm that no prostitute could be buried in their cemetery, so her admirers found a spot on a nearby hill overlooking the town. Julia's body was placed in a silver casket and carried in a plain glass walled hearse through town. Sad I left the maid a lingering farewell taking. Julia had been in debt when she died at age 34. She owed almost $800 to saloons from her bar tab to keep the brothel stocked. Her belongings were auctioned off to cover the debt. She was not wealthy, but dressed very well and had expensive jewelry, mostly from customers as payment. Once asked what wealth is, Julia replied, To me, it's an abundance of the things I desire, friends and admirers, pretty gowns, 
I may not live in the grandest of homes, but I enjoy attending operas and balls. It was almost four months before any lead suspects came up in the murder case. About a week before she was murdered, Julia heard a murder was back in Nevada. Her testimony had sent him to jail. He might have been her killer. A few months after the killing, a French fellow by the name of John Millian tried to sell dress patterns to a lady in Gold Hill. The patterns and material were recognized as belonging to Julia Bulet. John Milan was now the prime suspect. Some of Julia's jewelry was found in Milian's trunk. He also admitted to being outside Julia's house on D Street the night she was murdered. He said he was on the lookout for thieves. But perhaps in a rush to judgment or being at the wrong place at the wrong time, John Millian was sentenced to pay the ultimate price after he was found guilty of the brutal murder. One person who witnessed the execution was a young writer named Mark Twain, who later wrote, I saw a man hang today and took note of every detail. I never wish to see it again. Ironically, John Millian was buried just a few feet away from Julia at the Flower Hill Cemetery where the prostitutes and criminals were buried. It certainly wasn't easy back then, especially limited where the choices and opportunities women were given. Arriving in Virginia City, Julia became a beloved businesswoman and wanted the lifestyle at the expense of her own virtue. Many prostitutes had been murdered and become cold cases since the beginning of the world's oldest profession. But there's something to be said about the tainted woman, whose funeral had the largest turnout Virginia City had ever known. Perhaps this plaque dedicated to her best expresses her legacy. In memory of Julia Bulat, angel of miners, friend of firemen, and administrator to the needy. She will forever be remembered as a soiled dove who had a heart of gold. Her legacy continues today. The hour was sad, I left the maid a lingering farewell, taking her sighs and tears her step.